Thank you. Roll call, please, Siana. Council Member Johnson. Here. Council Member Losey. Here. Council Member Stanfield. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Trent. Here. Mayor Long. Here. Thank you. We have a couple of proclamations tonight. Our first one is National American Indian Heritage Month proclamation. Get my thing here. In recognition and support of National American Indian Heritage Month, November 2022. Whereas the history and culture of our great nation have been significantly, significantly influenced by American Indians and indigenous peoples. And whereas the contributions of American Indians have enhanced the freedom, prosperity, and greatness of America today. And whereas the time has come to stop suppressing the memories of crimes committed against American Indians by the seizing and occupying of their land. And whereas their customs and traditions which were once repressed are now respected and celebrated as part of a rich legacy throughout the United States. And whereas Native American Awareness Week began in 1976 and recognition was expanded by Congress and approved by President George Bush in August 1990, designating the month of November as National American Indian Heritage Month. And whereas in honor of National American Indian Heritage Month, community celebrations as well as cultural, artistic, educational, and historical activities have been planned throughout the nation. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that I, Sue Long, by virtue of the authority of us me as mayor of the city of Fortuna, do hereby proclaim November as National American Indian Heritage Month in the city and urge all of our citizens to observe this month with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. We have Virginia and Norma here to accept this proclamation, and we are going to get your address and mail that to you if that's okay. We found a typo that we'd like to correct before we send it out. Okay, come on up to the microphone. I just want to say thank you for the proclamation. The Daughters of the American Revolution, Eel River Valley, we do a lot of stuff for Native Americans, mostly scholarships. We bring speakers to the area. We just had a Creek speaker come and talk at Bridgeville School and Cuddyback School. And this is just one of the things we do, and we're so glad you took time to do it. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Our next uh, proclamation is Great American Smoke Out, and Mike Johnson is going to read and present this one. <coughs> Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Here, you want to borrow this? Thank you. All right, Mike. A great American Smoke Out, November 17th, 2022. Whereas the American Cancer Society encourages all tobacco users to join the Great American Smoke Out and quit tobacco for at least one day, and whereas each year nearly 34,000 California adults die from smoking and 20,300 kids become new daily smokers, and whereas flavored tobacco products made smoking and vaping electronic cigarettes attractive to youth and harder to quit, and whereas more than 84% of high school smokers used electronic cigarettes, almost all of which are flavored, and whereas electronic cigarettes create hazardous waste in the form of plastics, semiconductors, heavy metals, lithium ion batteries, for which there is no established disposal or recovery procedure. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that Sue Long, by virtue of the authority vested in her as mayor of the city of Fortuna, recognizes and supports the American Cancer Society's Great American Smokeout on Thursday, November 17, 2022, and encourages all residents who use tobacco products to consider that they do not have to stop smoking in one day, but just start with day one. Signed this seventh day of November, 2022, at the city of Fortuna, state of California. Sue Long, Mayor. So we have one person in the audience to accept this, and we also have Josh Sweet on Zoom. Josh, if you want to say anything. All right, if he raises his hand or unmutes, we'll come back to him. So go ahead and come up to the podium. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you, Mayor Long. Uh, 
Um, I'm Jay McCubbery. I'm part of a coalition of people in Humboldt County called the Tobacco Education Network. And uh, Josh is a young man, I hope he can sign on here, uh, who has been through the ringer in terms of being a young person growing up in this new age of vaping and electronic smoking products. Uh, so there are a lot of measures being taken. I feel like Mike mentioned earlier, coming full circle, unfortunately, youth smoking rates are up there at about what they were for adults 20 years ago in the high schools because of these flavored electronic smoking products. And uh, I think I'll just say a word about um, this at public, uh, public comment time. Uh, but I do want to mention that the Great American Smoke Out, as usual, is an annual event sponsored by the American Cancer Society, and it's all about quitting. Nicotine addiction is one of the hardest drugs to quit and um, can lead to lots of other drug use, especially when it's, you know, uh, the first drug that's uh, used by young people. So we're doing a lot to help prevent that in the first place, but also there's a lot of great resources out there, especially Kick It California, um, Quit Vape, I think, if you just text that. Uh, you'll find some information on there, it's especially for young people. And becomeanx.org is a great resource, online resource, to help people quit. So thank you again for your time tonight and uh, support of this event. You're welcome. Mayor Long. I do see a hand raised on Zoom uh, from a phone number that is 672-5942. Do you want to put that one through? Can you hear me? If you're there, you can unmute. Yeah. Great. Good evening. I'm Joshua Sweet, and I'm a youth substance abuse advocate and a member of the TIDE Coalition, a youth coalition that aims to educate the community about tobacco control issues. We've known for a while now that nicotine products are addictive and harmful to our health, yet we still allow them to be sold pretty much everywhere. Sure, we've put restrictions on tobacco companies, but they only came back stronger by targeting our youth with flavored e-cigarette devices. And it worked. They managed to market these flavored e-cigarette devices in a way that appealed to youth and got them hooked on it. Both middle schools and high schools have reported a significant increase in student vaping, and it will only get worse unless we come together to stop it. But stopping tobacco companies is only part of the problem. Nicotine is an incredibly addictive substance and can seem impossible to quit. But it's not impossible. With dedication and support from friends or family and the right resources like kickitca.org, those with a nicotine addiction can quit the habit. This coming Great American Smoke Out, be the support someone in your life needs, whether that's a friend, a parent, a sibling, a coworker, you name it. Maybe you're ready to quit and need some help doing it. Now's the time to find someone to help you through. By helping those close to us or ourselves triumph over nicotine addiction, we not only improve the overall health of our community, but we also take a stand against big tobacco, one butt at a time. Thank you, Josh. We appreciate your comments tonight. All right, moving on to introduction of some new employees. We have our first one um, as a public works project manager. Thanks. And I'm going to introduce Matt Nyberg tonight. Brendan Bird, our Public Works Director, uh, is is out sick today, so I'm going to do that. But it is my pleasure to I've been to be able to introduce Matt Nyberg, our new Public Works Project Manager. Matt also has an engineering background. It's a it's a really difficult field to hire people into these days, and and you know we're we're very fortunate that we were able to hire Matt, and especially because he has such an extensive background in the city of Fortuna. Um, Matt has been in Fortuna for quite a while. Matt was born and raised and graduated from Fortuna High School. He played football at College of the Redwoods in Sac State and actually won a state championship with that team at the year they went D1. He also won a championship at College of the Redwoods um, when he played football there. Um, Matt has developed a, a strong practical knowledge working various jobs before he went into engineering. He's worked in construction, managing his family's dairy, installing dairy equipment, and working at Wyckoff's Plumbing. Um, Matt put himself through college late in life and attended College of the Redwoods and Humboldt State University while he was working, which is a very tough thing to do, and raising a family, I think, too, at the same time. Um, Matt graduated um, 
with an engineering degree from HSU in 2016, and he's worked at Baird Engineering for six years from 2016 to 2022. Matt's also raised his family with his wife, Patty. They raised six children that all grew up and went to school in the city of Fortuna. Matt continues to give back to the community, and he coaches youth in high school football and wrestling. And then Matt has really already demonstrated his ability to take the lead on projects and be the responsible person on projects. He's working on our water tank coating project. He's been helping with Avancel Reservoir improvements in, in timber. And then Matt will also be helping in the near term with the SB 1383 compliance. So it's great to have somebody like Matt who knows the city of Fortuna well and is able to take the lead on the projects right away. So we're thrilled to have Matt here. And uh, with that, Matt, if you'd like to say a couple words, welcome. Good evening. Thank you. Um, so yesterday I was talking to my wife about tonight. I was going to get to come up and say something. And she busts out with, I'm proud to be a Fortunian. And then like two verses of just, it was, I wish I could just play that for you. It would have been better. Um, but I did grow up here my whole life. I tried to give back to this community as much as it gave to me. It's, I'm super proud to be a part of it. Um, it's an amazing place. Um, when I got this job, I was super excited to work with Merritt and Brendan and Jake. And, uh, you know, once I got to work, it's been about a month here coming up on the 10th. And I just have to say that the, the you know, the wastewater treatment plant, public works and the parks, the interaction with these people and the way they work together, it's, it's incredible. And I very much enjoy what I'm doing so far, and I hope that I'm fitting in, because it's quite, quite a network. Just thank you. Welcome, Matt. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Welcome aboard. All right, we have another employee who was doing this introduction. I lost my place here. Bob, <laughs> hi. Good evening, Council. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor. Um, it's my privilege uh, to introduce you. Our Final position being filled in the Public Works of the Streets Division, uh, Corbin Reback. Corbin's uh, also a Fortuna uh, graduate, he grew up here. A lot of you may know his family history as well. They're uh, a large family on both sides that have uh, kind of just put into this community. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Corbin, uh, you know, one of the things uh, in high school, he worked, I think is a theme, is worked at Wyckoff's. So, you know, I think there's a theme here. So, um, but he has, uh, you no, know, he likes hunting and fishing and things of that nature, outdoor stuff. <clears throat> so the goals for Corbin is to, to serve and excel in maintaining the city infrastructure. And he likes to become more confident in all aspects of the public works. <clears throat> Need to be streets need to be water department or even treatment plant. He's, he's always available and willing to learn. So I just wanted to introduce you, uh, Corbin Reed. I'd just like to say thank you for the opportunity, especially with me being so young, taking on a young kid I know is scary sometimes, but I'm just here to give it my best effort and I'm willing to try anything. Thank well, you, guys. We, we love young people, so welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, with that, if anyone has any comments from the public at this time, you have three minutes to come up and address the council on anything that's not on the agenda or anything that's on the consent calendar. Thank you once again, Jay McCubbery. I'm with the uh, Tobacco Education Network, a community coalition that includes several projects funded by the California Department of Public Health and community citizens and youth coalition members, Josh, who you just heard. Um, we are working uh, with uh, the County of Humboldt. Uh, they have already discussed a potential solution, one part of the solution to this youth vaping crisis that we mentioned earlier. And um, that is to license tobacco retailers. You know, I didn't bring one with me, but these vaping devices now, even single-use disposable plastic things, can contain as much nicotine to get three kids hooked in a week sharing that device at school. They come in all kinds of flavors, like banana and grape and rainbow Skittles. Uh, these flavors are obviously targeting children, and there's no regulation. There's more regulation 
for a store selling bananas than there is a store selling banana flavored vapes. So we're working at the local level to uh, create a level playing field for all tobacco merchants that they would be licensed locally and that license fee supports uh, regular enforcement and monitoring of, of tobacco laws. Um, so we have these kinds of uh, model policies available. They've been adopted in jurisdictions throughout California and we can do that here too to help, help reduce this vaping crisis. You've probably heard uh, how popular it is among youth and what a problem it is in our schools. So we're hoping that um, the city will bring this up at a future date and we have lots of resources to help, technical assistance, model policies, uh, actual on the ground assistance, public education, merchant education, and uh, we can make this happen here to create a healthier Fortuna. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, my name is Arlene Spires, and I just wanted to remind everybody to get out there and vote if you haven't already sent in your ballot. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, we'll close public comment and move on to our consent calendar. We have four items tonight, including city council minutes, report of disbursements, um, an authorization for the city manager to continue teleconference public meetings for city council and all city committees, commissions, and boards pursuant to Assembly Bill 361, a letter of interest and support to Humboldt Waste Management Authority for leading regionalization for the purposes of organics processing in compliance with SB 1383. Um, does anyone wish to pull anything? Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the consent uh, calendar items A through D. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Moving on to our city council business. Our first item is a supplemental budget request for recreation division to increase the budget for part-time employees by 26,329 and increase the recreation program revenue budget by $30,000. We have a staff report. Yeah, Cameron Mole is gonna be pre presenting the staff report and I'll just say that he, he had a little bit input to this report for myself and then Aaron Felmley helped him with some of the financial piece and I know that Emily Apodaca had a lot to help provide with that in the attachments as well. So Cameron can provide that report. Thank you, Merritt. Good evening, City Council and Mayor. Uh, I understand I'm in the hot seat tonight. Whenever there's money <laughs> being discussed, uh, you're in the hot seat. So, um, but yes, thank you. Uh, so, you know, I'm just going to basically summarize uh, the staff report that you see in front of you. And then after uh, my summary, I'm going to turn it over to Emily Apodaca. She's our recreation supervisor. She has a, a brief PowerPoint. Um, and then we can answer any questions after that. Um, so a goal of our, our division is always to offer a variety of programs to the community and at the moment we feel very strongly that we're offering programs for every single demographic from newborns all the way to seniors. Um, and if you remember in 2021, uh, basically when the pandemic hit or prior to that, uh, we had to reduce hours because a lot of our programs uh, were closed down due to, due to COVID. Um, so that full-time position, that recreation supervisor position at the time went down to a part-time position. And then as we started to come out of COVID, COVID and see the programs uh, were alive again, um, I took it to city council to approve to bring that position back from part-time to full-time. It was really difficult to find a qualified part-time employee at the time to do the job of the recreation coordinator. So thank you for bringing it back full time. And I think that uh, Emily and we have proven uh, that we have really um, made some, some great improvements and adjustments to our recreation division. Um, so our intention uh, is, to, is to provide new and improved recreation program opportunities, including the addition of new programs, which we've done, expansion of our existing programs, and improving the overall quality of those programs. Um, and you can see a, a bulleted list of some of those programs, which I'll go over, and we've really accomplished these goals within a short period of time, within about a year's time. So we have added additional roller skate sessions per week since 2021. Uh, previous to that, we would do one, max two sessions 
sessions per week. Um, and our participation for the skating program has increased dramatically from an average estimated 30 skaters a session in 2018, that's pre-pandemic, to 65 skaters uh, per session thus far uh, in 2022. Uh, our Hot Shots participation, that's our youth basketball program, went up a whopping 21% in 2022 from 2019. Again, that was the last pre-pandemic year that we had the, the program, and that was the highest previously recorded um, participation numbers to date. So we went from 285 participa participants in 2019 to 362. Uh, we started a drop-in volleyball program uh, that was volunteer run. However, uh, in the, luckily that program really grew and the volunteer felt like they couldn't handle the, the increase in participation, so we did have to staff that program. We've done a few paint and sip nights. Those have been really popular with the adults. Uh, we started a bike rodeo and that went really well this last May. We had 85 or 86 kids, I think, participate in that. Uh, we've done a scavenger hunt uh, and our spookathon is very popular. Uh, the last couple of years, we've had about 2,000 uh, people in attendance at both of those events and over 500 children. Um, and then we started our kids' play group. Uh, that play group is fully funded, including the staff hours uh, by first five. However, it still takes um, some supervision over that staff to operate that program. So in addition to the staff hours for those programs, uh, it was also identified that we needed more training. A lot of the staff that we hire are young staff and they don't come in 100% equipped to deal with some issues that one might see, especially in youth programs. Um, so we knew that we needed to add some training so that they would be more well equipped. Um, and some of those trainings would include CPR for stage, just for safety reasons, vigilance training, dealing with difficult behaviors and ideal customer services, service practices. Um, and we did, I will note that we have experienced quite a few behavioral issues. This is not just uh, independent to our programs, but across the board, a lot of childcare uh, programs have had some difficulties with behavioral issues. So that does take a little bit of extra staff time and care. Um, and so both the expenditures and revenues have increased with that additional expansion of those uh, pre-forementioned programs. And facilitating those programs requires that staff time to pull it off. Um, number one, you know, we need to have safe ratios as far as camp goes, uh, uh, staff to children, as well as providing enough staff for the increase in participation for the events to really pull those events off successfully or uh, programs. Um, so the amount of hours that were budgeted previously for the rec leaders and the coordinators combined was 7,550 hours. Um, and last year we did exceed that amount. Uh, we went over about 800 hours, uh, totaling 8,246 hours. Uh, and that, that over budget cost was $16,165. And uh, I take full responsibility for that. That was an oversight on my part. However, the good news is, is that the revenue uh, really makes up for that, that shortfall. Um, so the revenue from the skate camp program the last fiscal year, fiscal year 21-22, increased significantly. Um, and the revenue from Kitty Camp and Summer Fun was, a down, was down slightly. Um, of course, we were still in COVID and we did have some, some weeks of closures for our camp, which also means a loss of revenue. And some of the staff were out sick as well, so we couldn't accommodate uh, some of those numbers with the staff also being out sick. Um, the skate, skate program revenue in fiscal year 21-22 was 46,000 and change, which is 26,000 and change over the highest pre-pandemic year in 1819. Uh, that's a difference of 19,866. The revenues were down approximately $3,000 in fiscal year 21-22. Again, uh, had we not had those those few weeks of closures due to COVID for camp, we estimate about a $20,000 hit to our uh, potential revenue in that regard. And it's anticipated that uh, the current year uh, division budget will be similar or hopefully greater as far as revenue goes. That was experienced last fiscal year. Um, but the current budget doesn't accurately reflect the amount of revenue or expenses. Uh, so that's the main thing is we wanna make sure that we are um, accurate with our, our uh, estimations. So our request is to increase that expense budget and the revenue budget by increasing the budget for each. Um, 
The ask is to request that the expense budget for part-time hours increase by $26,329 for a total of 1,450 hours that would be added to that 7,550. That would give us 9,000 hours of part-time staff hours to utilize per year. And we did a calculation as far as what percentage would be rec coordinators versus rec leaders. And that amount equates to 40% of those hours going towards recreation coordinators, which do a higher level than the rec leaders. Uh, um, and uh, the 60% towards the rec leaders. Um, so again, yes, the, the, the ask is to increase the budget 26,329 for expenses, but then also increase the revenue budget by $30,000, and I feel that's a conservative number. Um, next, you'll see a, a table uh, comparing us to some other similar cities in size, uh, a couple of those within Humboldt County. And my goal here was just kind of demonstrating uh, what the difference is as far as what some of these other cities of similar size put towards their recreation budget and put towards their part-time recreation budget. Um, so I've got Fortuna listed here uh, with about 12,000 uh, people. Arcata, 18,000 plus people, Healdsburg, 11,000 plus people, and McKinleyville, 16,000 plus people. It's important to keep in mind that all of those agencies, uh, except for Fortuna, have multiple full-time employees that can support their part-time recreation staff. We have one full-time employee, and that's Emily Apodaca, our recreation supervisor. Um, so as you can see, we spend significantly less than other cities that have a more robust recreation program. And our goal is to continue to improve and enhance and create more op recreational opportunities for the public. As far as the fiscal impact, um, of course, we're asking to increase the budget, both the expense and revenue, and add that additional 1,450 hours to give us 9,000. Um, and increase the budgeted amount for revenue from 120 to 150 thousand. I will note that last year we made 183 plus thousand dollars. So this is a, a conservative estimate, but always good to play it safe, especially when Aaron Felmley is your finance director. Play it conservative. Um, so we're actually asking to put more into revenue than we are uh, in expenses by the tune of about three thousand six hundred seventy-one dollars. And then I'll go to my attachments. I've got the supplemental budget request. I'll have Aaron assist me on this, but that basically breaks down the revenues. You can see that we want to adjust the current budget and the recreation program fees from 120000 uh, to $165,000. That's $45,000 additional in revenue. Um, I do know uh, in previous years, some of the uh, pavilion use fees were going, uh, or some of the, the fees that the public was paying was going into pavilion use fees, but should have gone into the recreation program fees. So we've made that adjustment, which totals $30,000 uh, added to the recreation budget. And then as far as expenditures, just that, that $26,329. Uh, so going from $132,537 uh, to $158,886 or $866. The next uh, attachment you'll see um, is a table that was generated by Emily um, to kind of show what each of our programs are and what the anticipated hours that would be to operate those programs or the ideal hours. Um, and you can see uh, it also shows, you know, how many staff hours um, and there's a couple tables to the right that kind of break down the cost. Uh, so skate and summer camps are definitely our biggest programs. You can see most hours are allocated towards those two programs. Um, we use volunteers when we can, again, but sometimes uh, you're not able to do that. Um, and so uh, the dream would be, if you tally up all of those hours at the bottom of this table, uh, the dream would be to have $11,500, but we feel that that's not uh, plausible. So we're asking for uh, a little bit less than that, but more than we've had in the past to continue to grow. Um, and then you'll see on the far right table that there are a few shortfalls, uh, but however, since we're, our, uh, we're not asking for 11,500 hours, we're asking for 9,000 hours, we should not see any shortfalls uh, in any of, of those programs or any losses. The next table shows just uh, our skate participation numbers uh, from 2021 calendar year to 2022. Um, the shaded area, those were estimated. We did not have very good records from previous years as far as what attendance was uh, for public skate part or public uh, skate and private skate parties. Um, so those were estimated in the shaded area. But you can see in July 2021, um, those numbers dramatically increase 
we can't hold three sessions of skate during the summer because a lot of our staff are tied up with summer fun and kitty camp. But you can see starting in October how that number really jumps. Uh, once school goes back into session, we can utilize more staff to support that program. And then if you go into 2022, you see a, a very significant increase in the attendance. Um, so there is a need and people um, really want, really enjoy our programs, but it does take staff to pull it off. The last table is a summary of our program revenue in fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year uh, of all four quarters of fiscal year 21-22 and just quarter one of this year, the current quarter that we are in. Um, and the most important tables are gonna be the table on the far left and the far right. Um, so if you compare quarter one from fiscal year 21-22, FYE is fiscal year ending in 2022, uh, all the way to the right for, for the current fiscal year, you'll see there's a, a quite significant increase. So even in just the last year, we've seen uh, an increase in revenues for a majority of our programs. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Emily. She's got a short presentation, and then we'll be ready to answer some questions. Thank you, Cameron. Emily, I don't see you in this meeting. It's showing that it is scheduled to start at 6 p.m. Here, let me bring you the login information. We're all still learning. Thanks for your patience <laughs> with our technical difficulties. Thank you. In the meantime, Merritt or Aaron, did you have anything that you wanted to add at, at this time? Okay. I can just clarify on the SBR that the reason we reduced the pavilion is because the skate program used to be charged there prior to COVID, and then we had that COVID lapse, then things changed, and we never updated the budget to reflect that change. So um, we used to budget $15,000 for skate, and that was when we were doing just the one day a week program. And so now we're adjusting it to 45,000 to account for doing three days. So it's three times the amount that we used to budget for. Mute the microphone on your computer. All right. There it is. Success? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, Good evening, Council. Good evening, Mayor. I am going to be sharing with you just some of the um, things that we are doing in recreation that are why we are asking for some more hours to kind of illustrate what we have going on and where we're using those hours. Um, echoing what Cameron said, whoa, my goodness, a little earlier, um, prior to July of 2021, um, we didn't have nearly as much as we have going right now. We did have some skate. We have definitely expanded. Um, we had some drop in basketball. We have currently expanded. Um, we had drop in pickleball, some camps, and our hot shots use basketball. Um, since that time last year, we have expanded our public skate. Um, our hot shots basketball is one of the ones I'm going to be touching on in particular in a minute here, um, as that is one that there has been a lot of community response to expanding and improving the program. Um, we've added a little more with our drop in. We have more months of drop in basketball. We have drop in volleyball. Um, we are working on expanding our events and classes. Um, and I'm going to in particular touch on a couple more of those here. Um, the skating rink. 
as we mentioned, is one that has had quite a bit of expansion since July of 2021. Um, currently, we do offer almost year-round three public skate offerings per weekend. Um, the only time that changes is during our summer camps between staffing and just facility use. Um, Saturdays and Sundays during the summer are the only public skate that we offer. Um, otherwise, we do offer all three days during the weekend. Uh, within that, we have also expanded to having regular monthly theme nights. Um, a lot of those include discount nights. Some of them are tied into local events like our Apple Harvest Skate we had at the beginning of October. Um, we have been trying to pull in other events um, that the community has shown some interest in. So we, last month, um, just tried a strange Strange Happenings at the Fortuna Skatering, which was a Stranger Things themed event. Um, we sold out of that event uh, very quickly. We ended up having to turn folks away at the door, um, and that has been something that we have had kind of consistently uh, in the last years. Our skating program has gotten to the point where we do sometimes have folks waiting outside until our numbers are low enough that we can let people in as more folks leave. Um, so there's definitely a, a big, um, community desire to have more of that available. And with these really big nights where we are selling out, we do need more staff to be able to manage the large crowds. Um, staff are also very helpful in our marketing for these programs, which is a big part of why we have more folks coming out to our skating rink. Um, we've really stepped up our advertising. I'm able to do a lot more flyering and outreach with the support from staff. Um, hot shots, again, kind of highlighting what we're working on with our uh, building up our recreation programs. We've had a lot of um, families and community members who are involved in hot shots give some feedback on things they'd like to see improved or changed in the program. And so one of the goals this year is to take some of that feedback from folks and see what we can do to improve that program. And again, that takes a lot of staff time and support. Um, we have plans to Im excuse me, implement uh, player evaluations this year. We're gonna be separating some of the kids out based on ages and ability a little more to help even out our teams. Um, we wanna provide more support to our coaches and our referees. Um, we want to give the kids more opportunity to build their skills and develop um, kind of what we're looking for with the program is not just a come in and play basketball, but really learn about the game. Um, and again, to do that, that takes some staff time and some support to put those infrastructure pieces in place. Um, we have really expanded our event offerings in particular as well. Um, we are strange excuse me, strange happenings at the Fortuna Skating Rink. Our Stranger Things event was our first attempt at a trivia night. Again, that did sell out pretty quickly. We had a lot of folks really interested in that one. Um, we are hoping to do more of those. Uh, we've had some paint and sips. Again, we are trying to tie into more of what the larger community has going on. So as events like Apple Harvest come up, we wanna try to pull in more events related to those. Um, we've got a couple really big events that we have started doing in the last couple years. We've got Bike Rodeo, Pastels in the Park, and Roner Park, Roner Park Spookathon, which is our big Halloween event. Um, as Cameron mentioned, both of the last couple years with the Spookathon in particular, we've had over 500 of our local youth come out, as well as over 2,000 people, and that's a lot of legwork and a lot of... Um, pieces to put together to be able to put on these events. Um, I feel like the community is really having a positive response to having more of these, so we would like to be able to continue to offer those. Um, especially coming out of COVID, we feel it's very important to have these opportunities to build up community connections, create new connections between new groups. Um, a lot of our events pull in outside or, or outside organizations like Changing Tides, First Five, um, things that really helps support the community at large. Um, and then just to kind of emphasize what the staff hours are going towards. Um, for our rec leaders, again, we have a lot more folks participating in our programs. Um, that just 
number of bodies means we need more bodies to help manage the people, um, but we also want more highly qualified staff with those bodies, and so we are implementing a lot more trainings with those. Um, our planning program and preparation, you can see up in the top right corner there, that's an example of some of our Spookathon prep. Staff spent a lot of time doing things like stuffing bags, preparing prizes, a lot of the things that are behind the scenes that um, folks don't always see, but we have to have in place to be able to host these sorts of things. Um, another big one that has come up with our skating program is our skate maintenance and safety checks. Um, we have implemented a three times a year rotation where we safety check every single skate. Um, we're checking all of the pieces and we're cleaning all of the pieces. And you can see the bottom left picture there is an example of what our skates look like after about two months of use. We have some weekends, uh, particularly in winter months, where we will have over a thousand people in a weekend coming out and skating and our skates get a lot of use. And so for safety, to make sure everyone is safe on their skates and just to protect our investment between the facility and the skates themselves, um, we do need to be able to maintain them and take care of them um, and make sure that folks are safe when they're out with the programs with us. Um, my coordinators um, are extremely helpful with some of the admin that we work on. Um, a big piece with the Spookathon, for example, they were able to go out and solicit donations around town. They were able to raise um, over $6,100 between donations in monetary and some prize donations for the event, um, which covered most of the cost of the event. Our current budget right now with recreation doesn't allow a lot of space for creating these events, so it's really essential to be able to have these resources to pull in and to be able to reach out to the community for donations. Um, and again, being able to advertise and get marketing out um, is really how we're able to build these programs. And so it's very helpful to have them be able to come in and assist with that. Um, because we have programs running seven days a week, I am not always able to be there in person. They are a uh, essential liaison for me between our frontline rec leaders on some of these programs where I'm not physically there. They are kind of my um, eyes and ears to be able to help support our rec leaders. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to emphasize uh, up here in the corner is our graph. This is just a visual of one of those attachments that Cameron had mentioned a minute ago. Um, the quarter one of fiscal year ending in 2022 and quarter one Fiscal year ending in 2023 is the darker blue. Um, as you can see, we are already off to a stronger start just in this quarter um, with a lot of the infrastructure that we have been able to get in place thus far. And so we are working on continuing to build and expand on our programs. And we're very excited about it. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Does anyone have questions? I have a question to start off with. I'm not understanding your summary of projected staff hours. Emily, could you? Yes. Can you just run through what the columns mean for me? Yeah, so the first, let's see, to the left of the first black bar, um, I just tried to summarize within each program about what am I looking at for the staff hours that would be requir required in an ideal um, kind of world for each program broken down by uh, leaders and coordinators. So for example, looking at a uh, skate program just up at the top there, um, on average, about four staff per shift, sometimes less if we have less people, but again, on our nights where we're selling out, sometimes it's more than that. Um, shifts, we have, again, three public skates per week. Each public skate is four hours per shift. Works out to about 48 hours per week. Um, broken down into the amount of time uh, split between leaders and coordinators, and then the column next to that is just any particular notes for that program. Um, the next set of the two bars in between there with the Fortuna Parks and Rec cost per user day. Um, and then I have one for leaders and one for coordinators. So how much is it costing us in staff hours per user day, um, user day being uh, like a Saturday public skate would be one user day. Um, the next set of black bars, 
is kind of what it looks like from the public's end. So what is the program cost to the public? For example, skate, again, you have the different prices based on uh, age coming in. The demographics served, um, that was, I just included that because I'm using this to also evaluate my own programs and kind of wanted to see what our breakdown was in terms of what um, demographic of the community that program is serving. Um, and then I looked at the average number of user days per year. So how many, for example, public skate sessions do we have per year? Um, in 2023, we're gonna have 124. Um, the very last column is the average revenue per user day. Um, and then the cost recovery on staffing hours. Um, so again, using skate as the example, um, an average skate is going to be, or public skate session is gonna bring in a little over $300. Um, and then the staffing cost recovery is on average gonna be about $9. I don't know if that helps. Staffing there... cost, cost recovery, what do you mean? We're bringing in 300, what's the $9? So the $9 would be a baseline of what is what is in addition to the staffing costs. Oh, that's the difference between the 295 and the 304. Gotcha. Oh, yes. Okay. That okay. Is, now I'm you. seeing your columns are starting to make a little bit more sense. So the hours over here on the far left are per year, the 1522 and the 505? Yes. Okay. I get, okay, I get it now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, there's a lot of information on there. Yeah, and I just wasn't, it wasn't clicking which numbers were adding up to which columns, so thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else have questions for Cameron or Emily? I do. Um, it, it had been for years, um, skate, public skating was on Fridays. So uh, how often do you now have it, three days a week? We have Friday and Saturday nights and Sunday afternoons, yeah. And Sunday, okay. Um, how many people, at, during the skate times, how many people are allowed in the pavilion at one time? Um, our max number of skaters on the floor is 128. Uh, staff monitor during public skate to see about how many folks we have on the bleachers. If we have a lot of folks sitting out, we will sometimes let up to 130, 135 people in. Um, nights where we have almost all folks on the floor, we do cap it at 125 to allow for any staff that might be going out to skate. Um, our events where we have sold out, we did cap it at 120. Okay, and you have what, four staff on at? Um, for a full night where we are selling out, we have four to five staff. Um, on nights that are lower, so on, let's say we had a night with 60 people, we would typically have three staff. So how do you schedule for that? How do you know how many are coming for the night and what do you do? So I've been tracking since I started, I've been tracking uh, how many folks are coming in for each public skate session. So I, at this point I have kind of a baseline for, I feel like the seasonality. Um, as we have gotten into winter just in the last few weeks, I've added a person per shift, but we are still monitoring by night and we do have a coordinator on duty during public skate that if our numbers are lower, they will ask for volunteers to head home or will assign staff to head out early because we are overstaffed. Okay. Other questions, Mike? Um, so on your uh, program revenue uh, summary, under the last column, the first, it says uh, 2023 first quarter one, 43,895 for that quarter, that is a uh, projection? No, that is the actual quarter one revenue. It is the first quarter mm -hmm. revenue. Wait, how can it be? Yeah. That's the last column that says fiscal year 2023, first quarter. Fiscal year ending, FYE, fiscal year ending 2023. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. So Um, I think you guys are doing a, a fantastic job. Um, the revenue has, uh, it, it appears like it certainly has increased. My concern is just coming off of um, COVID and exactly what that's going to look at down the road and especially looking at uh, um, increasing the, the budget by the 26,000 plus. And that's, that's a concern that I have. 
even though the revenue is increasing more than 26,000? Well, and that it, it is offset and I'll do like that. <laughs> and I understand the um, additional, you know, hours and, and personnel that you have to employ. So um, I, I don't like the idea of um, departments coming back after the budget's been set and requesting additional um, you know, funds. Um, but like I say, the, the additional revenue is welcomed. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. You. I was just gonna, I, you've done a lot of work documenting everything and I'm like Mike in that, and like all of us really, that we don't usually enjoy when come back for a second bite at the apple. But it looks like the documentation's here, the numbers are here to show that you have the revenue to support it. I think it'll last, the numbers are gonna be good through the rest of this year and we can see what happens, so. I think since both of you brought that up, my question is, did you not have these numbers available when we were doing the budget preparation? Why, why did we not see this ahead of time, ahead of the budget? I think a lot of that had to do with we didn't anticipate the participation that we, that we were going to see. So by the time the budget came out, you know, things were still on the rise. So it wasn't until after the budget had been approved that we've seen this sudden rise in participation. So, um, and I, I don't think at the time we expected to go over staff hours, but that's really what it took to pull off successful programs. Okay. And I'm guessing at this point your anticipation is that that growth will continue. Um, you know, certainly, Pat, certainly more than during COVID, but you know, coming through that, and then in next year, and hopefully the year after that. Yeah, the addition of the 1,450 hours will give us a lot of extra wiggle room, and our hope is that we will not exceed that budget. In fact, hopefully, be under that budget. Uh, we exceeded it by about 800 hours this last fiscal year, as you heard, but we do plan to continue to grow. So we do need the additional staff hours to so that we don't go over budget again. And was it 2122 that it was 3000 over? That's correct. Okay. So that's not that long ago. <laughs> uh, my only other question is Aaron. Uh, gave us an idea. I mean, I, I know you know, you've crunched the numbers and everything, so are these numbers accurate? Can we, if the um, <coughs> participation is as anticipated, are the numbers gonna come in um, on a surplus here? Yeah, so like Cameron mentioned, I like to be conservative in my estimates. So I do think that the $150,000 total for recreation programs is is probably gonna be met and, and probably exceeded by a little amount. So. I have confidence that they'll hit that for this fiscal year and we'll have to reevaluate you know, come budget time or mid-year budget time to make sure we're still on track. And just as an, as an example, we budgeted revenue-wise $120,000 and we generated over $180,000 for the last fiscal year. And it looks like you, April, May, June, which is our last quarter of the fiscal year, 22 uh, that's when your big increase hit but you couldn't get the numbers collated and to look at until after the budget was already done so correct um, I think another thing as far as staff hours and budgeting um, prior to this last year's budget um, in the looking at the skate participation one of the things that we didn't I think anticipate was the extensive need for this gate maintenance. It is a large chunk of the hours. Oh. Um, just gate maintenance alone is over a thousand hours doing it three times a year. Um, we didn't, I think, identify the need for that until we got late quarter three, early quarter four of last year. Um, because one of the ways that it was managed in the past is there was a volunteer that came in and did all of that for everyone. Um, and then going from that to suddenly having thousands of people in a weekend really drove home pretty quickly that we needed to address it. Um, it wasn't something I think that we 
anticipated being quite such a large need for staffing hours, but it's very important for safety and um, yeah, maintaining our equipment. Tammy. Okay. Um, first of all, it puts council in a really hard position when we, we about do the budget because we're real trying to stay within budget and you've already used your year's worth of hours in the first first quarter or the first four months of this so we really don't have a choice if we don't approve any more hours you you can have no more programs it would have been nice if you would have come before you used up all the hours and asked for additional hours it would have been a lot easier to do this um, I'm really concerned with the, the economy the um, like last year you talk about hot shots. Hot shots was really good last year because Fortuna was the only one that had a program. Eureka didn't have theirs, Ferndale didn't have theirs, and um, the, the reservations, theirs wasn't going on at the same time. This year, they all are. So I definitely see revenue going down you know, on that. So I don't think you can count on that full amount of revenue this year because all of the other places now will be having their hot shots. So those students that came here last year because there wasn't any place else to go and wanted to do something all went in our department. Um, I, I, you talk about a lot about the revenue, but it doesn't show any of the expenses. Um, the expenses for your specialty, um, the, the special nights, the prizes, the food, the, all that stuff, none of those expenses are shown in any of this. It's just the revenue. And in some of my calculations, I don't come up with, with as, as much as you did in that. I think we need to be conservative on how much we do. And just because we're making more, I don't think we need to necessarily have to spend that because we have two positions in the parks that are funded by Measure Z, E. I get those two mixed up, Measure E. And if we can save, you know, if we can generate more income and not have to do so much expenses, if our, our Measure E, fund, our budget will go down next year. We won't, be, we won't be getting as much as we do, and instead of having to cut something else, we can maybe use some of that money that's in the revenue to cover some of those expenses. I don't want to lose any more expenses, and it's really hard for me to authorize more <coughs> positions because the hours that you're asking for basically is to... Um, Instead of them being seasonal part-time workers, you're asking for two permanent part-time workers for the amount of extra hours that you're we're doing. And I also have a question on, um, you've been averaging 100, probably 120 or more hours a week between your um, coordinators and yourself since summer fund's been over. What have you been doing every single week for that amount of hours? Uh, we have all three of our public skate sessions as well as multiple public, or sorry, private parties that we run in addition to parties during public skate. And so the skate program administration on its own is a large chunk of my time. Um, we have to plan for upcoming camps. Um, I have staff that are training for things like skate maintenance um, that we have had some staff just kind of come in on as other staff have been at other jobs and or otherwise scheduled. Um, we have uh, multiple advertising sorts of things going on. We have flyering, we have um, calendars for, again, skate camps. Um, we have a number of revamping infrastructure things for hot shots that take a fair amount of admin time. Um, we have also been doing a transition to Tyler Parks and Rec that is taking a significant amount of time. Um, and so my coordinators have been taking some of their time to assist with things in particular like skate so that I'm able to get our systems up and running for our new online system. Um, I don't believe it made it into attachments, uh, but I do have a breakdown of what my coordinators assist with and what I have on the daily in terms of um, kind of regular duties in the office. I don't know how to share that right now. Or 
And Mayor Long, maybe, maybe Emily, you know, if one of the council members wanted to come down and kind of see what's happening on a weekly basis, yeah. could you run through that and kind of show them what the coordinators are doing? And Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it might be a better way just to be in person and actually kind of seeing what they're, they're up to. And I will note that those hours do ebb and flow. For example, with the Spookathon, it took a huge effort to prepare for that event. And then there's cleanup, of course, after that event. And there's a lot of staff to pull that event off when the event happens. So, for example, this week, now that, you know, Spookathon's over a week over, we haven't been utilizing a lot of our part-time staff for administrative purposes because there's kind of a lull now until we start to prepare for the next event. So our hours do kind of fluctuate depending on the need and depending on the event or the program. And I think for October in particular too, we had every other weekend, sorry, every other weekend in October we had an event. So there was a large amount of both planning and cleanup and post event follow up as well for October in particular. Okay, so you, you have, um, I think last pay period, 17 employees got paychecks. That sounds right. So it's not just, I mean, there's a lot of hours that are going out um, so the coordinators, are they just working office hours? Are they working, because um, there was a lot of office hours, you know, for those two. So what are they doing that are, you know, compared to what you're doing and they're doing? Um, we have a lot of digitization um, in terms of like paperwork, especially until we get up and running on the online portal system. Um, they, in particular, again, for October with Spookathon, they spent a lot of time on uh, working with donors um, and, in particular, going out physically in town to try to solicit donations. Uh, Spookathon, in particular, was almost entirely covered by donation costs, um, which would not have been possible without having them have time to get out and look for donations and solicit donations. Um, they also are essential in terms of helping me manage our rec leaders for, um, I have a, for example, a coordinator that works every public skate session. Um, so he is in every, every three days of the weekend. Um, I have them assist me with some of the um, record keeping for, like I mentioned, I'm doing a lot of tracking of numbers for programs and stuff like that. And so they help me input some of that data into spreadsheets. Um, yeah, kind of that end of things is helpful. Okay, when these positions were first authorized, it was mainly for to bring in more to summer fun, more um, creativity, more activities. So what activities have you implemented for um, the summer fun programs and the, that, are, that are new? I guess I'm not sure exactly how to answer well, that question. Summer, having... summer fun, from what I'm hearing, basically they're watching the kids play, you know. So I'd like to know, is there more activities? Do Is there structured activities? We have every week, we have a structured um, calendar that goes out. Um, all of the staff have breakdowns of uh, what activity they're doing. The coordinators um, get materials prepped as well as get... Um, instructions listed for the staff. They go over um, plans for transitions. They address um, any kid things that come up in terms of uh, behavior management for the week. Um, it is much more, at least this last summer, was much more structured um, than the previous summer, and the coordinators are a large part of that. Okay. <clears throat> I don't think we have a choice. We're going to have to authorize some more hours because your hours are gone. Um, I would like to be conservative and not maybe do quite as many um, because I think the revenue is going to be going down through this past year. It's showing that I'm also on another committee in Eureka, um, for, I mean for the county, and their, their budget is going way back and way, you know, um, pulling way back on their expenses. And I think maybe we should maybe not do quite as much. and. I, I don't like the idea of actually having more employees because that's that's where the big expenses are and I don't want to have to cut employees, you know, bring them on and then cut them back when the budget can't handle it. 
Yeah, and we're not necessarily asking for additional employees just for more hours for our employees. And that is also a good thing because it helps us retain our staff. And right now we've got a lot of really good staff. We've got staff, some coordinators that actually have degrees in recreation administration. So they're a huge benefit to our programs. And so we'd like to be able to mac maximize their effort because Emily just quite frankly can't do all that can be done in 40 hours a week. She just needs some additional support in order to continue the, the, to maintain the programs and hopefully they would continue to grow. I don't see why they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. They have dramatically. And I think a lot of that has to do with the hard work that Emily and her staff have done to bring in that participation. I don't think it's just a fluke that just numbers came up. A lot of it has to do with that marketing and creating a higher quality program that people are recognizing. So the attendance is going up, the participation has gone up. And we have for every camp for example, in 2022, we have had to close the wait list, or sorry, close registration before camp started and have actually ended up having to close wait lists because we have had such a high demand. As so as, as, far as, as far as the kitty camps and summer fun, um, do you have to put a limit on how many people can, because you have, you have um, basically 10 to 12 kids for, per leader? Can't you just hire more leaders if you have more kids? And your hours we would like to, but uh, that's difficult. The workforce is really difficult to hire staff at this moment. I'm sure a lot of other people are experiencing that. Um, so, you know, we, we basically took what the, the most qualified candidates that we could, but we still have to fall within that ratio in order to keep the kids safe and for them to have an enjoyable experience. So for summer fun, we don't like to exceed a one to 11 staff ratio. And then for kitty camp, we don't like to exceed a one to eight ratio. So if we don't have enough staff, then unfortunately people get put on the wait list, which again means more revenue. So, I mean, there are certain areas in particular, summer fun and kitty camp where we could utilize more staff, um, so that we could allow more participants in. Our, our goal is to meet the needs of as many people and allow as many people, if not all people, into our programs, but sometimes we're just limited to the number of staff that we have, qualified staff. Maybe I can offer a middle ground suggestion. Um, your request of 26,329 is based on the 9,000 hours However, your overage was only 8246. And I understand you're looking for, you know, additional hours beyond that. But maybe some middle ground would be somewhere in the middle, 16,165, which would be the overage um, for the 8246. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So I have a couple questions based on what Tammy brought up. Are your expenses still within your budget? aside from salaries? Yes, so and that's expenses. really difficult to do because inflation has gone up so much that it constrains us even more. For example, our Hot Shots program budget, um, last year was $3,200 for Hot Shots. The t-shirts that we ordered for each child exceeded that budget amount. So the current budget is making it really difficult for us, which is why, again, we rely on donations and solicit donations from the public so we can enhance our programs and do a little bit more than what's done in the past. So really, we're only asking to adjust this, the, the staffing hours so we can support the programs and certainly nothing else as far as department supplies go or anything. Um, but I do feel that we're pretty well constrained with a tight budget outside of our hours as well, or our, our staffing hours. But you have been able to stay within your budget on your actual department expenses. Yes, yes. So even though your staffing is over, your expenses are solid. I don't have the end of the year report in front of me, but Aaron would probably know better than myself. Yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, outside of the, the overage for part-time hours, everything else, if, if you took the total was under budget, there were some higher and some lower, but it equaled to be under what was budgeted for. Okay. Why can't I, I like Mike's idea. I don't want to not have programs because now they aren't going to add such and such because they're afraid they're going to go over their hours. The, hour, the hours that they're over and they're budgeting for are being offset by revenue. So why, why are we concerned? I'm not sure why we're concerned. Uh, if the department heads looked at it and the finance directors looked at it <clears throat> and the numbers add up, and we're not talking we're not talking supplies we're only talking labor I'm, I think it should fly 
Well, and what Emily said about if the skaters aren't requiring how the, as the number of staff that are actually scheduled, they are sending them home. So they're monitoring that and they're keeping track of that. And I think that that's just being responsible. And if we need the hours, we have them. And if we don't need them, they send the people home. I don't know what else you could do with that. What about during the week when they're in the office and you don't have a lot of stuff and you just have people, do you find stuff for them to do or? Um, if I don't have things for them, I don't schedule them to come in. But I uh, pretty consistently I, I, need That's a part I don't understand because we didn't have enough work for a full-time person and then we needed extra hours. So we brought, we, we changed that position back to full-time. And that's what that full-time position was supposed to do, was to increase the um, recreation programs and you know that kind of stuff, which some of them have been. But now we're asking for more part-time help, you know, in the office. And I just don't see, I don't see the need for all of that. You know, that's the, that's the part that I'm not quite understanding where all those hours are going. I feel that there is a need just because of the expansion of the program. So because we've grown so much previous to 2018 or pre-pandemic years, um, we, you know, there, it's just not possible to pull it off with one full-time employee. So therefore, Emily requires a little bit of assistance administratively to help really pull off those programs and make them high quality programs. And, and something to keep in mind, when we were taking a look at these programs, the numbers that they estimated for the recreation leaders and coordinators combined, those numbers were from the last recreation supervisor and those weren't updated in the last couple of years. So that's something that Aaron brought up to me. So last year they went over on the recreation hours and they went over, but they also brought in the revenue to support those hours. So the, the whole idea here is, you know, they're increasing the staff costs, but they're also increasing the revenue. So, you know, as council member Johnson pointed out there, you know, this is a net balance thing. We're really trying to make the budget reflect reality. And so there was a lot of, there had been some questions in the lead up to council meetings. So that's why a lot of this information was put in there. And I think it's important if folks want to see what's happening, you know, there's an opportunity for council members to go down and see what the coordinator's doing. But really the, the idea here was to have that budget just reflect the reality that we saw last year and what we expect to see this year. Um, council member Trent, if it helps just to kind of illustrate as an example, um, our skate program administration takes quite a bit of office time. Um, on Friday, I believe it was last Friday, I think I ended up spending close to four hours just answering phone calls and scheduling skate parties and doing paperwork just for skate parties. So being able to have coordinators in the office where I can take the first part of that, get a party started and situated, and then hand the paperwork processing off to a coordinator to take care of the rest of it, um, frees up a lot of that time for me to be able to facilitate and address the other programs that we have running also. So I think an, an element of it is just as the programs have expanded, like with SKATE and camp programs are similar, the amount on the back end, on the office end has expanded with that as well. So Erin, a question for you. Last year, the, the we, what did we went 8,000 over budget? It was 800 hours, 800 and it equated hours. about $16,000. So the increased revenue last year, what was that? I think it was, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I think it was around uh, twenty-five to 30000 more, mainly because of the skate program increase, and so that's why, that's the big reason After why we're After the expenses? Here. No, that, that was just in total, twenty-five to thirty additional from the skate program that we were not, that was not included in the budget for fiscal year end, 21. So the net was 25,000 minus 16, so we actually were ahead still. A little bit still. ahead of what we budgeted for, yes. Okay. So I know being really involved in the Hot Shots program last year, and I'm super excited that you guys are making some changes to a program that's been the same for like 30 some years since my kids were there, and that's like dating myself totally <laughs> because I've been involved in it that long. Um, I know that there was staffing when we had volunteers who did a hot shots uh, skills and drills, but there was still staffing by the city. But we want, wanted to give the kids, since they didn't have practice slots, we wanted to give them um, time to learn some things because it wasn't really working the way the program has been set up. And 
So that took extra time, and I don't know that we raised our hot shots fees to cover any of that. And so, um, but again, that's just giving our kids the same opportunities that they have in other cities who have a much more robust program. We also competed with Bear River last year. Bear River put a program out on Sundays, so hot shots, our hot shots was Saturday and Bear Rivers was Sunday. So I think that the kids had opportunities to go to Bear River. Some of them did. I know one of my grandsons went just because of a scheduling thing. So I'm not sure that Hot Shots is going to go down, especially if people see our program is improving. I think they're going to want to sign up. And I'm really hopeful, and I'm here to help you again. So whatever I can do, um, I will be there. Um, I want programs for our kids. I don't want you guys sitting there going, well, I don't think we can pull that off because we don't have enough staff. I don't think we can pull that off because we just can't put in the hours. If it's paying for itself and we're coming out ahead, I don't want to change it. I mean, you guys have to manage your time. You guys have to do the things. But if we're breaking even or coming out a little bit ahead, I don't, I don't have a problem with it. So, But I'm a kid person, and I want our kids to have everything that we can offer them. And if that means a little more time, as long as we're breaking even and we're not going in the hole and we're staying, you know, flat or just a little ahead, that works for me. So that's just my input. Well, I think we're all kid people. I think we all want the best for our children and um, our grandchildren. And we want the best programs and we want as many programs as we can get. Um, so that's, I, I don't, I mean, and you guys are doing a marvelous job. You really are. Um, like I said, my concern is coming off of the COVID and looking forward, it, it, you know, it's a projection, of course, like the budget is. It's a roadmap. But coming in five months into the fiscal year, current fiscal year, um, you know, it's a little, it's a little sketchy. Um, especially at $26,000. Um, I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to vote against that. Um, I made an offer as far as uh, um, some middle ground. Um, but um, Cameron, you said it. You're on the hot seat. <laughs> yeah, and I remember when I brought the part-time position back to a full-time position, you all kind of put me put me to the test and, and created a challenge for me. And I feel like I followed through in that challenge in a short period of time and demonstrated that we have improved our recreation programs by a landslide in a short period of time. So now we just need the additional staff hours to continue to watch it grow. So that's well, really, that's really the gist of the request. It's been really hard to judge what, what we can do because of COVID. We're just now seeing more potential because and COVID we, shut so many things down. That's correct. And we can't just continue to do what we've done in the past. I mean, that 7,550 hours, I don't know how long that's been there for. That could have been there for decades, right? right? <laughs> so, I mean, my goal when I came into this position, when I became the Parks and Rec Director here, and I come from more of a recreation background, I realized that the recreation programs here needed a lot of help. So we're trying to get those recreation programs up to speed, and unfortunately, that costs money And so as far as staffing, because one person, one full-time employee can't do it all. Since, especially since we operate seven days a week. Right. And the expectation there when we did increase, well, when we, when we authorized the full-time position in the very first place, um, the expectation was that the programs would improve, there would be more programs, that that um, recreation supervisor would do a full-time job as opposed to the part-time job. So. That's correct. And that, that position historically has been a full-time job. It just went from full-time to part-time during the pandemic because we just weren't seeing the revenue. Um, so we diminished it down to a, a part-time. But historically, the recreation supervisor position has always been a full-time position. So. And the other, the fail-safe is that if participation falls, you see it in the skating numbers and you cut staff to match the need. So if the participation falls, labor rates fall because you have less staff. So. Well, my concern as well as some of the other people up here <clears throat> tonight was um, having this come after the budget. But your explanation as to you know, not seeing the numbers before we had our budget workshops, that 
puts my mind a little more at ease and the fact that we are positive versus negative puts my mind at ease as well. I also just want to say that I am not against kids' programs. You know, I'm definitely for, for those, and that's not why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because I'm concerned about the budget. Um, being only four months into the budget and having no money left, you know, I, I kind of wish that maybe if you saw this coming, you would have brought it to our attention before it got to where you were out of hours. Um, so we don't have a choice, you know, we have to because we have to keep the programs going. We have to budget for it. Um, can you keep a closer eye on all of that and the hours, you know, and make sure that these are going to fit within, you know, what's budgeted and not to try not to go over again? And Yeah, that's something that, uh, um, yes, we will definitely be more attuned to. I know this last fiscal year we weren't getting regular <clears throat> budget reports, which we had in the past, so that usually helps me monitor where we are budget-wise. So I uh, kind of let that slip a little bit. We weren't getting those budget reports. Um, I you know, kind of felt like we were still going to be within the realm of our part-time hours, but unfortunately we did exceed those. But, again, that was due to the need and the participation. We're not just having people come in to work just to work. We're only utilizing them. Uh, as an, on a need basis. We've also implemented um, about, oh gosh, it was just before summer camps, um, a new scheduling program so that I don't have to do things by hand that's making it a lot easier for me to keep track of staffing hours kind of ongoing versus having to uh, math it all by their time cards and on our schedule. So that's helping quite a bit. I'm not seeing anything that says they were out of hours. Can somebody explain why we think that? If they're only increasing 1,450 hours and we're in November, we still have all the way through June to go. How are we out of hours already? I know we used, I don't know offhand how much, I know we used a large chunk with our summer camps. Um, we did have a very large summer camp program this year with a lot of staff. Um, and the fact that we were at a full 10 week summer and I think seven of those 10 weeks came in this fiscal year, um, a good chunk of our hours went to camps this summer. And I know that that was a large part of it for this year. Anything else from anybody? No, just doing a quick calculation and um, increasing that budget, recreation budget, by 26 through 29. We're still 50, well, not 50, but... Uh, yeah, pretty close to fifty thousand dollars less than McKinneyville, which is the next lowest or the high, but yeah, next lowest. So we're still fifty thousand less than the other recreation uh, divisions that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Correct. Are you looking at that um, little table, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's page two. So um, page the one thirty-two five thirty-seven is that with the twenty-six or is that without the twenty-six? That's, that's without, personal. that's without. That's without. Yep. Okay. And then the looking at the overall budget is what I was looking at, the 428, with the 26 through 29 added is 454, 497. I'm sure Aaron's uh, adding that all <laughs> And uh, then the closest is still the McKinley Hill, which is 518, 265. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Anything else from anyone? I have to say that um, <clears throat> I appreciate all the efforts that the Parks and Rec Department has put in and we asked them a while ago to increase activities and programs and that obviously comes with cost. They brought us a zero net increase um, proposal and I'm not sure why this took 40 minutes to be honest with you. Well, because we're very fiscally conservative. <laughs> and we've already had our finance director fiscally conservatively estimate the new revenue stream. I, I, I guess the, like what's been mentioned is the anticipation down the road. Um, are these programs going to continue? Uh, is the money going to continue to come in? Um, are other programs going to siphon those, those uh, participants off? Um, I think it's a discussion that needs to be made, especially five months into the current fiscal year. And we have a staff that we trust that just told us that if they have reduced 
revenue and reduced programs, they're going to have reduced labor. I think one thing that, and Aaron, I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. Um, in the past, you know, when I was first on the council, we had uh, budget reports in our, in our council packets every month, which was probably way too cumbersome. But I'm wondering if we can go back to maybe a quarterly so that we can see numbers before they are a concern. Like, you know, then it's on us if those numbers aren't adding up and we didn't say anything and we're not looking at it and we're not bringing it, you know, to anyone's attention. That's more on us, and it's not like an after the fact all the time because those questions can be asked. And I think once the, uh, our semi annual is, is too late, too long, and so I don't know what that does for you as far as extra work, but I think it would be really helpful for the council to have a quarterly budget report with percentages so you can kind of see, you know, we're three months in, so we should be at whatever that is, 25%, and if we're at 75, it's gonna be a big red flag to someone. Yeah, so I don't think that would be an issue. I've, I've trained the finance office supervisor now to send them out monthly, so she runs all the departments and sends them out, so I could just pull what she is already generating for each department and throw those onto the council agenda for you guys each quarter, even if each month if you really wanted to see those. Thank you. Yep. I think that would be helpful. I don't know what you guys are thinking, but I think that would. Anything else from anyone? Comments, questions? Does anyone from the public have any comments on this item? Seeing no comments, we will close public comment and bring it back to the council. I make a motion to approve the supplemental budget request increasing the budget for <clears throat> part-time recreation division labor by 26329 and increase the recreation program revenue budget by 30000 to include anticipated skate program revenue. Second. Did I hear a second? second. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right, thank you. Thank you, Emily, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Council. All right, our next item is to approve the revisions to the investment policy for fiscal year 2022-23. We have a staff report, please. Yes, all right. Well, this is the agenda item I'm sure you've all been waiting for. <laughs> um, so tonight uh, we have on the agenda uh, to review uh, revisions to the investment policy for fiscal year 22-23. Um, so next slide, please, Sianna. So the purpose of uh, the investment policy is to establish cash management and investment guidelines for the city treasurer, uh, who is responsible for the administration of the City of Fortuna investment program. It's the policy of the City of Fortuna to meet the short and long-term cash flow demands of the city in a manner uh, which will provide for the safety and principal and sufficient liquidity uh, while providing an investment return. And I'm going to uh, review kind of where the city stands with our current investments um, towards the end of this presentation. Um, but the city last reviewed the investment policy on July 15th, 2013. And so uh, it is long overdue for a, a formal review by the city council. And so staff has provided, uh, went through the investment policy and provided some suggested changes and included a red line version of the investment policy um, to show you what was being brought forward for change. Um, next slide, please, Sianna. Uh, so there are two changes, oh, sorry, go back one, please. So there are two changes uh, that I'd like to highlight. Um, the first one uh, is staff is proposing to increase the maximum percentage amount allowed uh, to be invested in certificate of deposits from 25% to 30%. And 30% is the maximum allowed by government code section 53601. Um, and one of the reasons that uh, staff is proposing to increase this to the maximum is that um, about seven or eight years ago, the city started investing with Edward Jones here uh, locally, um, primarily in CDs, and those have really been outperforming what we have earned uh, in our other investment options, so we want to try and take advantage of that. Um, and then uh, the second change that I wanted to highlight uh, was Government Code Section 53646 was previously mandated uh, cities bring forward investment 
uh, policies annually and quarterly reports be ren rendered to the legislative body. And AB 2853 amended the government code section to remove those requirements. Um, and so upon AB 2853, from my research, uh, when, once that became effective, this was before my time, the, city, the city's practice uh, changed to no longer provide those reports to the city council. Um, however, I, I wanted to get uh, the city council's input on if you guys would like to see those quarterly reports back on your council packet. It's something that internally I already essentially put together, so it's not too much additional work to throw it on the council agenda for you guys to review. Um, on the consent calendar each quarter, as well as staff is proposing to uh, make this more of an annual routine to bring forward the investment policy and, and make sure that if there's any changes in government code that um, they're being updated um, with the city council. Next slide, please, Sianna. So attached was the first quarter of fiscal year 22-23's uh, investment report. Um, and so you'll see the total amount invested is just shy of $36 million. However, I did want to note that the total funds um, listed in the investment report are pooled funds. So, um, you know, this, this comprises um, of many general funds, restricted funds, enterprise funds, such as water and wastewater. As the council knows, we have a large reserves in the wastewater fund currently um, for a, an impending wastewater treatment plant project. Um, but uh, one of the things that I wanted to highlight on the investment policy here is um, the institutions that we invest in. The first one is LAIF, um, and that's the local agency investment fund. That's a state approved and state run fund, and that's uh, commonly kind of the, the set standard or the, you know, the benchmark for cities to attain as far as effective yields. Um, and you can see for this last quarter, we earned 1.29% from our investments in that uh, particular category. Um, the Humboldt County Trust Fund, uh, you can see uh, we have about, we had about 25% invested in that. Uh, we have since pulled all of those funds from the county for a few reasons. Uh, one of those reasons was you can see that LAIF ended up um, returning higher returns than the County Trust Fund and, and previously the, the County Trust Fund was uh, returning higher yields and so we were keeping it in there um, but the second and and kind of the a long-standing issue that we've had is uh, we haven't been able to get updated um, investment reports from the county due to their auditor controller issues and so you can see here uh, the last report that we got from them was june 30 2021 uh, as far as our our balance report and then the effective yield report which is performed by the treasurer's office um, the most uh, recent report we had was from June 30, 2022. So it, essentially, it, it makes it really hard on staff to evaluate what investments are really performing at when there's such a huge delay. Um, and additionally, if you know, when we went to draw these funds, it took almost one month to, to actually get those funds from the county. So, you know, just the, the availability of those funds, um, whereas LAIF, it can be same day transferred to the city if we needed it to. So, We've since uh, withdrawn those funds, um, and this is another reason why uh, I think it's advisable to increase um, the amount to Edward Jones. Um, so the plan would be to take a portion of that amount that was um, with the county pool and put some of those into CDs with Edward Jones, as well as uh, up, you know, up to close to that maximum 30%, and the remaining would, would go to LAIF. Um, and then um, the next item, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our U.S. Bank general checking, some options that we'll have uh, with those monies to earn a, a decent yield. Um, but the remaining funds you can see are held. Um, general checking, that's for just ongoing uh, payables that we have. Um, so we like to try and keep about $3 million on hand because we have some big projects going on. And then our payroll checking account, we make transfers from the general checking account. So. We, we try and keep that balance fairly low. And then pity and cashier's change is just what our cashiers have on hand. So um, that uh, concludes, you can go to the next slide, please, Siana. That concludes my report. So staff is seeking um, direction from council um, on whether you want quarterly, annual, or no pre-scheduled investment <laughs> reports like we've been doing. 
um, included in council packets. And then once we uh, get that input, staff's recommendation is to approve the revisions of the investment policy for fiscal year 22-23 by adopting resolution 22-32. I'm happy to answer any questions. So Aaron, if you were gonna include a report, say quarterly, what would that format look like? Because 200 pages was not <laughs> what I was hoping for. I, I don't have to include all of the bank statements if you don't want me to. It would just be that one, that, that you know, report that was on the previous page or on the previous slide that I showed, just that one page report that showed the balances if that's what you guys would prefer. And I could just throw it on consent unless there was something that I felt that needed to be pointed out. That's got all the pertinent information. Yeah. <laughs> So just a quick question on that. <clears throat> it's just page after page. Is that the um, Humboldt County or is that the LAFE? Um, those were the statements for all, all of those investments. So Everything. Uh, yep, that was everything for September 30th. In case you wanted to check my numbers, you could. <laughs> and, so, and so the um, the money that we invest in both those pools then, um, it's, it's put into um, a big pool and then is invested. So we don't know and have, nor do we have any control over those individual uh, agencies that that money goes to. And is Correct. In. Okay. Yep. Once we send it to LAIF, it's, it's run by the state. And so they, they run it according to all the government code sections and we don't have any say with that. And same with the county pool, the, the county treasurer's office runs that and invests it. And we don't have any say once we send the funds to those like you said, for years, the Humboldt County um, Fund was um, outperforming late than anything else. And now, and I understand with the, you know, inflation and, and interest rates and all of that, it's just kind of bottomed out, though. Are other agencies doing the same thing? I have spoke with some other agencies, and, and they, are, they have pulled all their funds as well and moved them to LAIF and other investment options. So Aaron, on the actual investment policy that you redlined, one of the questions I had was this finance director is the treasurer and the finance director makes all the decisions. That scares me a little bit. I'm totally confident with you as the finance director, but not all finance directors are equal. So what does that look like? What's the oversight like to keep you from doing, not you, to keep the, fi finance director slash treasurer from going off the rails? I mean, what's, what are our safeguards? The safeguards, uh, well, one would be the investment, pol or the investment, you know, kind of breakdown summary sheet being brought to you guys uh, each quarter from now on. But I think the other major one is our annual audit. So our auditors come in and they do look at all these bank statements and check them and make sure that they are in accordance with government code and then make sure that the investments are, you know, well, uh, you know, safeguarded and, and the liquidity is there. And so I think the annual audit is the primary you know, safe safeguard for that. Thank you. Anyone else have questions or comments? I have some more questions. Go ahead. On your, um, on the um, investment policy itself on page two, and you've done a great job on this. I really appreciate you bringing this forward. I mean, after, you know, not having any of the council see this uh, as of 2013, that's going way back. And we need to see these this at least on, a, on an annual basis. Um, I don't know about quarterly, but certainly um, to review the policy every, every year, I think would be a good thing. On the bottom of the page, um, you, it start, the sentence starts out, controls deemed most important include and the very final is um, the final line, authorized investment officials, documentation of transactions and strategies, and code of ethics standards. I did not see a code of ethics standards for investments in the policy. Should there be one there? Sorry, what page? Oh, there it is. Um, so, I, th I mean, I could certainly attach it. That's more of just like an internal kind of document, but if, if you want it as an exhibit or something, we could, we could attach it to the investment it, policy, but. It states it in the policy, and I looked for it, couldn't find it, that's, so I'm, I'm just thinking maybe it needs to be there somewhere. <laughs> we can add it as an exhibit to, to 
policy moving forward. And my next question is page three, second paragraph down. And um, that paragraph starts, the treasurer shall maintain a list of authorized brokers, dealers, and yada, yada, yada. The final is the investment advisor may use their own list of approved brokers, dealers, and financial institutions for investment purposes. Should, and, and I understand their own list of approved is the city's list, right? I mean, I, I would say that it would, it would have to be in both lists. So if the advisor had their own list, they would have to you know, counter reference that with the city's list and make sure that those two were on both. Okay, so somewhere in there, I think, or you know, at the end, it needs to do after providing the list to the treasurer who authorizes it or okays it or whatever, at least to provide the list to you, the treasurer. I think it needs to be added. So this external investment advisor is Edward Jones currently? He's, is that what you're saying? He's currently the yes. only one that we we work with, yes. And in their list, I mean, we, you know, depending on, and I don't know that Edward Jones invests in much in third world countries or countries that use child labor or those kinds of things. Well, we at least want to know what their list is that they're using. And he calls me any, before any time. Any time he invests anything, he calls me beforehand and, and gets my authorization to proceed. So he 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 does check in and says, you know, we have a CD with yada yada bank at this rate and this you know this many years. Do you want to proceed? And so there's that that communication between the both of us. Is that he, Heck? No, or, that's Heck Wood with yeah. yeah. I think that's it. That I am. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? Anyone from the public wish to comment on this item? Seeing none, we will close public comment. Um, going back to Mike's thought on this maintaining the list, do you think that Edward Jones always knows how they're going to invest their money? Like, would they have a list or does that change? Yeah, I don't know if they would have a list, but like I said, he calls me beforehand and says, you know, it's, you know, a, whatever bank and they're, um, you know, they have, they meet all the, the requirements listed because he has a, a copy of our current investment policy and I'll give him the updated one. And so he verifies that they meet all the requirements as set forth in the subsections up if, you know, if it's a U.S. Treasury that they meet what's listed there and so on and so forth. So, so Mike, are you satisfied with that? as it's written then? Well, again, if Aaron is there, yes. If there's another um, finance director that isn't as on top of the world as Aaron is, I, have a, I would have a question about that then. Okay, well then when that happens, you can question it. How's that? <laughs> and the council has to approve all uh, department heads, so we'll take the council's <laughs> responsible. The problem being, sometimes we don't know until two or three years into it. <laughs> Well, Aaron That's fine. just can't leave. We'll just have him sign something, you know, sneak it in there somewhere that it's lifetime. That solves our problem. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other comments or questions? Someone want to make a motion? Do you have to do open a public comment? I did. Oh. They, the they all ran up to the microphone. Oh, I didn't <laughs> all right. Sorry, Mike. I'll move to adopt resolution 2022-32 and read by title only. Second. We have a motion and a second. Siana? Resolution 2022-32, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Fortuna approving the investment policy for the fiscal year 2022-23. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Stanfield? Yes. Councilmember Losey? <coughs> yes. Mayor Pro Tem Trent? Yes. Mayor Long? Yes. Thank you, Siana. Our next item is to authorize the finance director to set up a U.S. bank sweep account on the city's general checking account ending in 3254. Aaron. Yes, so good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. So this item is actually what made me do the previous item. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but uh, city staff uh, had been working with some of our banking partners to examine if newer improved investment options were available. 
um, as we were learning that the Federal Reserve uh, was going to raise interest rates. Um, and so um, upon that research, it was determined that setting up an auto sweep account for the city's general checking account uh, would provide the city with interest earning potential on the nearly $3 million that uh, is daily held in that account. And so historically, the city uh, has not been able to earn any interest on those balances held in that checking account, um, primarily due to the federal funds rate being near zero. Um, and for context, context, the average annualized return for the last 10 years for the money market fund that the city would be investing in through the sweep account has averaged 0.45%, and it was down at 0.01 for the last couple of years. Um, and so currently the rate uh, the city would be able to earn is at 2.75%. And if, if you'll compare that to uh, the investment report that we just ran over, that would be higher than LAFE is currently. And so that's kind of the benchmark that we always compare to. So not only would we be finally getting some advantage to our general checking account funds, but it would also be earning more than what we'd be earning with LAFE. Um, and so the U.S. Uh, bank auto sweep would go into the first American U.S. Treasury's obligation fund. This investment is considered a money market fund per the city's investment policy, uh, and, and it's an allowable uh, investment option under Section J, subsection 13. Um, and this, this fund has attained the highest ranking or the highest letter and numerical rating provided um, by not less than two NRS ROs. And um, those are AAA ratings, and those can be found on the attached uh, summary sheet. Um, and so uh, the financial impact um, using the $3 million that we usually hold in that general checking account and using the estimated rate of return of 2.75% would provide the city on an annual basis an additional $82,500 in revenue. Um, so splitting that out into kind of our main funds, 28% uh, would go to the general fund. And that would be about $23,000. 22% would go to the water fund. That would be about $18,000. And 39% would go to the, to the wastewater fund um, with the remaining 11% or $9,000 split amongst all of our, our remaining funds held by the city. Um, additionally, the U.S. Bank does charge $2,700 a year for the auto suite function, and that's the main reason that the city had, hadn't had that set up in the past is because the earnings rate didn't produce enough to, uh, you know, cover that $2,700 a year charge. Um, and the city will be able to uh, turn that charge off and turn that auto suite function off within a day if for some reason the fund, the earnings rate drops to a point where it doesn't cover the cost um, of, of, you know, having that that auto sweep function on the general checking account. So uh, staff's recommendation is to authorize the finance director to set up a U.S. bank sweep account on the city's general checking account ending in 3254, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Is the 2700 charged like right up front? Like you say you want to do the sweep account and they immediately charge you the 2700? It's charged per month. Okay, so it's yep. per month, okay. Yep. Anyone have questions or comments for Aaron? Can we sweep our LAFE account? <laughs> I mean, I can transfer it all to the, the checking account, but. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Anyone from the public wish to comment on this item? Um, hi, I'm Arlene Spires, and I just had a question about the interest that we earned on the sweep, and it's, is it pre-designated to those funds, or can it be used for any of the funds? Yeah, so uh, currently we pool all, all of our internal funds are kind of pooled all together, and that was shown on the uh, treasurer's report from my last staff report, so there's about $36 million. And so that $36 million makes up a whole bunch of our different internal funds, some of which are general funds, some of which are water funds, some of which are wastewater funds. Um, and so whatever we earn in the general checking account is, is a percentage of kind of the amount that the general fund holds within all of the funds that are pulled together. That makes oh, sense. I think I might have used the, instead of fund, I think I should have used the word department. Because are there, that interest is designated to certain departments? No, so it, it, we just designate it for 
the individual funds. So whatever fund it is, general fund, water fund, wastewater fund. And Arlene, if you would mind directing your questions to the so mayor sorry. and make sure that <laughs> so she sorry, Mary. direct our staff to answer. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I'm just I'm just interested in the the interest. So the interest that's being earned on the sweep account then is considered new income or new revenue. And so then is there what is is there something that's discussed as to what is done with that new revenue? Like is it used to support other programs or so our entire budget the way that Aaron broke down the percentages. So basically our entire budget, 28% of our budget is general fund. 18, 22% of our budget is the water fund or whatever Aaron's got down here. So basically that big chunk of money is split up into those same percentages. And so whatever goes into our general fund, that's what we spend on police and parks and pretty much we can spend that on whatever we want. Anything that goes into the water funds and the wastewater funds has to be spent on water projects and sewer projects. That's the only thing it can be spent on. Okay. So it can't just be randomly take $82,000 and go spend it on whatever we want. It goes it's distributed into the appropriate funds and then that money's budgeted every year when we do our budget. Okay, so then the money that goes into the general fund, is it just, does it go in any particular area of the general fund or just? General fund is just that, it's general and every year when we have the budget workshops, that's when the money is um, budgeted per department, per you know police, parks, staffing for admin, you know, city hall, all the things, streets, okay. that's all part of the general fund. So, so whatever money is available in the general fund, Aaron gives us, here's what our expected revenues are for the general fund, here's all of our departments and expected expenses, and then we go through page by page, line by line, and decide if that's what we're going to approve. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, we'll close public comment. Do you have a motion? I make a motion to authorize the finance director to set up a U.S. bank sweep account on the city's general checking account ending in 3254. I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Um, Aaron, I'm sorry. Going back to the previous one, we did not give you direction as to what we wanted as far as a quarterly investment report and an annual policy report. I think that was kind of the consensus of the, of the council was a quarterly investment report and then an annual policy, policy, invest, policy report. Perfect. Does that sound right? I don't know if we got that. Okay. That's what I had in there, so okay. that works. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on. City manager's report. Thank you, Mayor Long. Um, a few items. First, I'd like to review the upcoming council meeting dates. Our next regular scheduled meeting is on November 21st. Our next um, planning commission, which was scheduled for the 8th tomorrow, is canceled. So our next planning commission will be on November 22nd at 6 p.m. Our next Measure E meeting date is on December 20th. And then our upcoming uh, Roner Community Recreation and Park District, the next meeting is on December 7th. Just a few items. There was a lot of activity since the last council meeting um, with regard to the situation with PG&E. As you may recall, I reported last time that PG&E had informed the city that they had limited ability to serve more businesses. We received uh, an update that we were waiting for from PG&E on October 26, and it was a pretty significant difference from the original outlook, which was nine years and $900 million. And a lot of folks were very concerned about their ability to do business or build homes or expand their electricity use in the city. And essentially what PG&E conveyed to us at that meeting was the same as they conveyed to the Board of Supervisors on November 1st, which was that they have the capacity to serve all the applications that are currently in within the city of Fortuna, Rio Del area, basically an area from, you know, um, Fortuna south to Red Crest and including Ferndale. So kind of the northern portion of the South County, the area south of Eureka that they can serve those um, 13 existing applications. And as a part of the process, the city of Rio Del, the city of Fortuna, the county of Humboldt provided a list to PG&E with what the anticipated projects are. And, you know, I don't know what the total was, but they, um, you know, from Fortuna, I think we probably had 40 or so projects that were in the permitting process or approved. And they said, you know, I think there was significantly fewer in Rio Del and, and, and not a, a huge list in the county. So. They said they could serve the, um, 
the 60 anticipated projects from those three combined lists. They didn't give it back to us. So they have fairly um, strong certainty that they'll be able to adjust how they're running their system to be able to serve the projects needed in the foreseeable future. They also expressed that they're not concerned about being able to connect residential projects. The ones that they're concerned about are more of the commercial projects in the Fortuna Rio Dell area. And so I, that's really important, folks who think they might not be able to get power for their home. It's likely that um, the, all those homes, some of our public works projects like you know the police station or the senior center, a number of um, projects that um, don't have that large commercial use should be able to get power. But um, beyond that, um, PG&E has committed $16 million to be able to make uh, improvements to eliminate any restrictions by the end of 2024. So at the end of 2024, they expect to be able to serve the city business as usual without limitations. And so they, they divided the county into three areas. That's the first area and obviously the one we're most concerned with. They also provided some analysis for the area from Bridgeville to Alder Point in which um, they can serve the three existing applications that they had there, but there's some, they, they need to make improvements to be able to, um, in, to provide new projects. And so they have that in their timeline for being completed by the end of 2026 at a cost of 30 million. And then they're very concerned about their ability to serve Southern Humboldt, the Garberville Shelter Co to Shelter Cove and Petrolia areas. Um, they expressed that they're concerned about being able to provide any power. They don't have a, a great plan there, but they said they do have some ability to provide service uh, directly in the areas around Garberville, including the proposed health center um, that is down there. So really worrying, uh, worrisome for, for that part of the county. And I know that um, there's a lot of pressure on them to come up with a plan to serve that part of the county sooner, but you know, fairly good news for the city. We're still considering ways to really um, you know, set that commitment from PG&E in stone. Um, and so even though we, we have that commitment and PG&E has been very public about being able to serve the city and make those improvements in the next two years, we still wanna do everything we can to make sure that they follow through with that commitment. So we're still considering ways to go ahead and move forward and do that. Um, let's see, um, we're, we have FBID interviews scheduled for later this week for the part-time staff position. We still have a call out for um, advisory committee members. We have not seen a lot of a response from the community to volunteer for those advisory committee members. So my hope is to bring a staff person on and then really conduct more outreach when we have that st staff person on to try to get um, more volunteers for the advisory committee. I'm a little concerned that the community really, you know, voiced their support that they did want to see FBID proceed. And then we're seeing a very limited or few, you know, last time I checked, we had one application for the advisory but he's the advisory body. So I'm, you know, I think we really need to think about this next year when we renew that assessment. And if we're not seeing that participation and members of the business community step forward that, you know, we want to, I think we just really need to have the businesses support. This is for the businesses. It's a vehicle the city put in place. And it's, so it's something to think about as we move forward into next year and we get ready to consider renewing that assessment again. Um, I did have a meeting with uh, Scott Adair, um, the county's economic development coordinator, and Alicia Hayes, and it was really nice. They reached out to me, and they want to um, look for more opportunities to collaborate with the city, and they've been including me in some of the um, listening sessions for wind power and what could be happening there as um, that could involve the city and opportunities in the future, and they're, they're trying to make some connections between uh, the city in Fortuna and Humboldt, Cal Poly Humboldt, and also CR, just to see you know what opportunities could exist between the city and those uh, educational institutions, you know, with their expansion and growth in the future. Um, the the police facility is out to bid. Uh, the bid's open on December first, so Brendan and our public works staff is working on responding to requests for information and answering bid questions. Similarly, the Roner Park basketball court is also out to bid. We ended up having to rebid that project and scale back some of the amenities, you know, get rid of the concrete patio and have, you know, uh, somewhat of a scaled back version without compromising the basketball courts. So we, we removed some of the planners and we have some, you know, more basic improvements, but we still have landscaping planners and other things that we can add in the future, but we didn't want to compromise the basketball court. So those bids are gonna open on November 17th. That's a Measure E funded project that we're very anxious to deliver. Uh, and then we were also, um, we partnered with um, the County of Humboldt. The city owns the library building and we have an MOU with the county to run the library there. And so we worked with Chris Cooper and some of the folks from the library to submit a building, a building forward library grant. We were notified, um, 
a couple of weeks ago that we received a little over 350,000 to make building improvements, including accessibility, some reconfiguration, energy upgrades, emergency generator, uh, solar, and other building improvements. The solar is particularly nice. The city pays the utility bill, so if we can get solar on there and reduce our utility bill, it's you know more you know just reducing the expenses of the city and taking advantage of grant funds. So Katie Schmidt and our community development department and Chris Cooper did a lot of the legwork, and so you know one of those grants that you know you just should we go for this you see it come across your desk and you know some of them we get some of them we don't so it was nice to hear that we got one and it'll be a challenging project because it's a building project and those are always challenging but it'll be nice to see those improvements to the library building you know some of those are long overdue um, and then we continue to work um, as staff for the Roner community recreation and park district and there they adopted at their last meeting a resolution um, to conduct an engineer's report for the purpose of um, determining what an assessment would be needed for to to pay for the construction and operation of a pool and then they also adopted a resolution identifying what the ballot procedures are and so Cameron and myself and others Aaron you know it's, there's there's a lot of work that goes into thinking about the how to how to you know put together a project like this the districts also brought on a financial advisor that that we're working with um or financial analysts so in as well as working with planning firms so there's a lot happening and um, the district is very close to um, starting to do public outreach and present the pool options that are under consideration and let the public know how much they cost and so that's really going to be the point when the public you know sees sees what these pools could be and, and the benefit they could provide and decide whether or not they want to pay for them and provide that feedback to the district prior to the district looking to do an assessment vote. So that's going to be a really critical step in the process to hear what the public thinks and that's coming up. So we've seen more attendance. I think Council Member Losey was at the last meeting and probably brought some folks with him, maybe from Pickleball. There was really good attendance at the last meeting. So it's nice to see folks getting um, interested, involved, and sharing their concerns so we can move this forward in a way that meets the public's need. <coughs> That concludes my um, my report. Thank you. All right. Any future agenda items that we don't have on our list already? I was going to request some information from Jay McCubbery, and then I might be bringing an agenda item back for the licensing of tobacco stores. You want to see what the county's policy is any information you can give me. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike, and uh, Mayor and Council members. Um, yeah, so uh, I believe it was the end of August, uh, the staff with Humboldt County Public Health, along with support from our coalition of uh, public health funded projects and youth volunteers, uh, community members gave a presentation to the Board of Supervisors where they looked at provisions in, that are included in a model tobacco retail license policy. These kinds of policies are considered uh, public health best, best practices to address the epidemic of youth vaping, especially in our middle schools even, and high schools. So. Um, this model policy, they looked at it and they said, yes, this looks good. We'd like to get some feedback from the community. They directed public health to talk to some merchants, uh, to work out some of the details on how it would be enforced. And um, so we can, uh, uh, and they also said, we'd like the coalition and public members from the public health community to bring this policy to other jurisdictions because they would like to see everybody on the same playing field. You know, no discrepancies or differences between the rules and regulations that tobacco retailers need to abide by. So what these policies do... Okay, wait. Mm. It's not on our agenda. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> right. So if you, if you can in. coordinate with Mike, and then we will look at whatever you're bringing forward, see if we want to add that to one of our agendas and have you come down and make the actual presentation. Okay, yeah, okay. that would be great. That's right. what we would really like to do and uh, get everybody on, on the same page. All right, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, then we get that on our list. Thank you. Anything else? All right, 
Um, moving on to City Council reports, Mike Johnson. Well, it's been an interesting few weeks uh, since the last meeting. I also attend, attended the Board of Supervisors meeting and followed Mayor Long in making a public comment and getting some more support for Fortuna in there, asking more questions as to how we got where we got and what can be done about it. A uh, few items on the horizon. Uh, the, we have a ribbon cutting this coming Wednesday at 1230 for Creations uh, to grand opening for their business and come out and support them. As was previously brought up by uh, Arlene Spires, tomorrow, vote. Get your voice out, get heard. Um, I have a historical commission meeting this week on Wednesday, but I'll be unable to make it. And my alternate, uh, Jeremy Stanfield, is going to sit in for me. And it, we had a, I attended the business women's luncheon where we honor the business woman of the year and the uh, woman of distinction. And I will let some of the other people that attended that make that announcement, but I will say for uh, Cameron staff that uh, the people there were excellent. Uh, Kiwanis, uh, which I'm also a part of, uh, they couldn't say enough good things. So, and that's all I have uh, to report today. Thank you, Mike. Um, I need a quick break, so you guys just go, Mike, and then Jeremy just keep it moving, and I'll yeah. be right back. On uh, October 27th, I had a Redwood Coast Energy Authority meeting. The board heard a report on the two-year cycle for the integrated resource plan portfolio. And during the report, we heard from eight different speakers. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, during the report, we heard from eight different speakers as well as four written comments on the elimination of the biomass energy um, portion of the portfolio and that uh, RCEA should eliminate that energy source due to the health damage that is done from the particulate emissions. Um, it was suggested that by, the, by several board members that maybe it's time to review the local agent resource adequacy issue and begin work between the Community Action uh, Committee, which is um, a part of the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, and the board in addressing the RCEA and state goals, and looking forward to the 23-24 cycle on clean energy. And there's going to be more to come on that subject in the future, I'm sure, not only um, with RCEA, but at the county level as well. We did receive a report from the executive director on the PG&E issues uh, that um, Merritt was discussing as well, and they were not much different from uh, what PG&E's presentation was to the Board of Supervisors last week. And the board authorized an MOU with the Fisherman, California Fishermen's Resiliency Association, which the Humboldt Bay Fishermen's Association is a part of, and that MOU is with regard to the offshore wind project and the major decisions that will be uh, involved in the future um, with the Fishermen's Association and um, how that's going to be affected with the offshore wind. And then um, I'm sure you all uh, heard of that the federal government announced the opening bids for the offshore wind energy project. That'll be starting on December the 6th and probably lasting you know, about two days or so. There will be quite a few national companies which will be bidding on that project. And Morrill Bay is the other location for offshore wind development. But it's pretty much been decided that Humboldt Bay would be the best port to develop the harbor infrastructure for building and staging the foundation, um, towers, turbines, and many of the other com uh, components of the wind turbines. So it means a lot for Humboldt Bay. It means a lot for Humboldt County. The Harbor, Humboldt Bay Harbor District announced an agreement with the Crowley Offshore Wind Energy Company for the design and development of the port. And um, 
Crowley Offshore Wind is an international family-run company that started in the U.S. with, um, and, and they have many, many major port, marine port projects throughout the world. Um, this company, family-run, as I said, is started in 1892 in San Francisco. And um, it was um, primarily ferrying supplies back and forth from the port out to ships um, to build ports somewhere else, and it's, it's quite an organization. Multi-billion dollar um, group, and so I'd just like to congratulate the Humboldt Bay Harbor District for making that connection and agreement with uh, such a great company like Crowley, Crowley to be the developer of the marine terminal. That's all I have. All right, thank you. Jeremy. I actually don't have anything to, excuse me. <clears throat> um, until FBID gets underway, I don't have anything to report there. And I uh, think the Parks and Rec uh, um, staff for being here tonight and all the uh, continued progress they're making in the programs there. And then I'm looking forward to the Historical Society or Historical Commission meeting on Wednesday. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremy. Tammy. Mike Johnson reported everything that I was going to report, so I have nothing else to report. <laughs> <laughs> I even stopped early, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tammy. Um, we were able, to, with the chamber, um, to, and the help of city, Siana Merritt, to coordinate a little event for the cross-country teams that came to Fortuna on Saturday. They came in on Friday night and kind of cruised through the park to check out the course and we were able to have the Axe House there and uh, the Mexican food truck that's at Ace Hardware all the time that are my neighbors and I can never pronounce their name. And Shots Coffee came out and it was pouring down rain during the race and then in the afternoon there was no rain. But anyway, I think that probably was a good advantage for CR because they're used to that weather but I don't know how much the other racers enjoyed it. But anyway, good turnout. Um, here in Fortuna and it was nice to coordinate a little something for them and it seemed like um, they kind of trickled in to re to look at the course on Friday night so the food truck didn't get backed up and the Axe House didn't really get backed up but they were just kind of steady and um, the coaches the next day said that the athletes enjoyed it and had a good time so hopefully we made a good impression for our city and that maybe they'll come back to visit us again so I got the donuts Oh, and donuts, yeah. I tried. I was trying to forget the donuts. <laughs> I'm not eating donuts. So, yeah, it was it was good. And yeah, if you haven't had those little donuts, they're really really good. Um, there's a chamber mixer next Wednesday night at Cornerstone Realty, and I have been asked to speak at Rotary and then at a. a I forget what it's called, that Greg Foster from Redeck organizes every Wednesday at 10 o'clock um, about the PG&E issue. So we do have a few things to report that hopefully, uh, you know, we're moving in the right direction. So that's pretty cool. Um, as Mike said, uh, Tammy, Mike, and I, and Merritt all went to the Board of Supervisors meeting to listen to the presentation and throw in our two cents and our comments. And um, just really thankful for uh, Supervisor Bushnell and Bone, who have really been pushing, you know, for this and for PG&E to respond and to be willing to um, engage in meetings and discussions and all of the things. And, you know, just remembering that PG&E is a huge corporation and that the people here in our community who live and work here are not the final voices. They don't make the, the decisions, but they're having to take all of the, the input and the, you know, I wouldn't say wrath, but the, uh, what do we call it? I don't know, we're not happy. <laughs> and so they're having to deal with all of that. And so just keeping in mind that, you know, they're part of our community and hopefully we're not coming across as uh, too obnoxious and, and putting the blame on them because we know it isn't them. So um, the luncheon was cool as far as they used to only do one person and now the last few years they've split it into two they split it into business woman of the year and woman woman of distinction and i actually thought it was pretty cool this year because tina taylor got woman of Dis woman of distinction and she's been around for a while she does a ton of stuff in the community but she's very low-key she never wants to be 
in the public eye. She just, you know, very quietly goes about her business doing all the things. And so she's been doing that for years and years and years. And then Kim Brown was our businesswoman of the year, who's our young next generation up and comer, you know, who's just giving back a ton to her community. And she owns her own business at a young age. And she's just, um, she's that next next generation that we need because all of us are getting older and eventually we're going to be saying we're too old to plan these things and we've got you know this great example role model coming right behind all of us so that was pretty cool that it, there was such a uh you know the younger and the older and it was just a really cool balance so i was really pleased with the um the, pe the people that they picked this year so it was fun all right i think i'm done talking um we do have a closed session to um, public employee performance evaluation pursuant to section 54957 of the government code for the city manager. So we will be adjourning to closed session at this time. Motion to adjourn to closed session. And second. All right, we will re adjourn to closed session. Thank you guys for coming tonight. We appreciate it. Recording stuff.